Welcome back. I hope this finds you well. Uh, I want to start by uh, somehow sharing my appreciation for those of you who uh, who participate with me on Cora.com, who support and help support my school on Patreon.com slash TLK. Um, and those of you who watch these videos, um, you make my practice great. So... Um, we will continue. I know this is a long go show, but it's truly a meaty one. It's uh, full of a lot of lessons. Um, and as you know, um, my whole practice is about, uh, never quite sure how to say this, but it's my own, um, experience with a study of Buddhism, uh, sectarianism, um, and all manner of uh, scholarship. By that I mean from, from within and from without uh, the Buddhist uh, lineage, lineage, wow, lineages. <laughs> uh, in other words, whether it was from monasteries or, or temples or schools and universities, right? Scholarship of all sorts. And as the uh, Buddha Shakyamuni taught, uh, we are to study broadly for this very reason, because uh, cultures, languages, ideologies, they get mixed in to, quote, translations uh, or interpretations of teachings, and it's only through our own uh, determined uh, research and study uh, that uh, we lead our own minds to through and to navigate uh, these differences and uh, polish our understanding of what was actually meant. Uh, if you read enough, uh, study enough, and uh, concentrate enough, thought, think about enough the uh, the various schools of scholarship. Um, the, the basic nuggets, they do percolate up uh, and uh, you start to dispel. And it's not just that translators and scholars have uh, influenced their translations, but it's our own minds. Uh, and this is much more to the point, actually, that uh, if you understand exactly where Shakyamuni Buddha was headed with his teachings, uh, then... Uh, it, you, you would have clarity very quickly, uh, but that's simply not the case, especially in our modern world, right? Uh, we navigate through lots of self-illusions, self-tendencies and opinions that we don't even know we're making a lot of the time. We just accept things because that's the way we think they are until we read enough information, in other words, question our own thoughts, that... Uh, we have these aha moments. Oh, wow, I have, you know, now I get it, right? Um, so this is study, okay? And uh, we're reading here in uh, the opening of the eyes of uh, Nietzsche's own uh, process in this. So we've been, so far he's been talking about the process of Buddhism in its scholarship, in its entirety, and Nietzsche is an excellent, excellent example of chasing scholarship, right? This guy is very well read. And also, he's sharing in this opening of the eyes a very intimate portrait of himself and how he himself has, well, I thought I was doing everything right, but maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not what I think I was trying to accomplish with my life. Maybe that's an illusion. So, it's, it's a very intimate portrait of a man who has intense scholarship and even as knowledgeable and experienced as he is, is sharing with his students, you and I, um, that 
there, even then there is occasion to doubt, right? So um, now we're going to move into another sector, um, but I don't want to. I want to spoil the fun. So here we go. In the sutras preached before the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha is shown predicting that various great bodhisattvas and heavenly and human beings will attain Buddhahood in the future. <clears throat> right, the predictions. Uh, predictions really not like Nosferatu and so forth, but predictions really meant to help you assuage the fear of his students. People who in the earlier teachings, as has been repeated over and over, uh, would, would practice their entire lives but not attain uh, the enlightened, the fully enlightened state or the Buddha way, right? Uh, and, and in the Lotus Sutra, he predicts, in other words, he tells them, you too will attain enlightenment if you follow, or if you follow, if you, <clears throat> if you, uh, practice in this way. So, but trying to realize such predictions is like trying to grasp the moon in the water. It's a, it's a poetic way of saying what I just said. Like trying to grasp the moon in water, like mistaking the reflection for the actual objects. If somebody tells you you can be president of the United States, it doesn't mean you automatically become president of the United States. Although, anyway... <laughs> Bad example. <clears throat> it has the color and shape of the object, but not the reality. Likewise, the Buddha would seem to be displaying profound kindness in making such predictions. But in fact, it is little kindness at all. Because what he's pointing to is we get we were flattered by the fact that the Buddha will recognize that we can attain Buddhahood, right? It's flattering, but it's also not flattering at all because it really sets out a path for us that's very hard to accomplish. So, it's interesting the way he chooses to say that. Remember, this is over 700 years ago, so people spoke differently, right? When the world-honored one had first attained enlightenment and had not yet begun to preach, more than 60 great bodhisattvas, including Dharma Wisdom, Forest of Merits, Diamond Banner, and the Diamond Storehouse, appeared from the various Buddha lands of the Ten Directions and came before Shakyamuni Buddha, the Lord of Teachings. There, at the request of the Bodhisattva Chief Wise, Moon of Deliverance, and others, they preached the doctrines of the Ten Stages of Security, the Ten Stages of Practice, the Ten Stages of Devotion, and the Ten Stages of Development. And there's more on this, of course. And these teachings are very dense, or sermons, if you will, are very dense. So um, this is part of practice. You get these footnotes and these terminologies and so forth, and you can, start, you can go off on tangents for a long time. Uh, and that's okay if you do that. There's, all of it's good. And so forth, he says. The doctrines that these great bodhisattvas preached were not learned from Shakyamuni Buddha, at that time, Brahma and other deities of the world of the Ten Directions came together and preached the various teachings, but again, those were not what they had learned from Shakyamuni. These great bodhisattvas, deities, dragons, and others who appeared in the assembly, described in the Flower Garland Sutra, were beings who had dwelt in, quote, inconceivable emancipation, end quote, since before Shakyamuni began preaching. Perhaps they were disciples of Shakyamuni when he was carrying out bodhisattva practices in previous existences. Or perhaps they were disciples of previous Buddhas of the worlds of the Ten Directions. In any event, they were not disciples of the Shakyamuni who first attained enlightenment in this world and expounded his lifetime teachings. So what does this mean? I, I run into this all the time. It sounds like, especially the way it's translated, pardon me, that um, there were many Buddhas. There were many uh, actual persons and actual lifetimes and actual previous existences and so forth and so forth. This creates a lot of confusion to the modern human who uh, in our day and age, we like to take everything literally. 
Buddhism, if you're going to study Buddhism, it's nothing literal. Everything in Buddhism is expedient means or skillful devices. They're the use of the way our human mind likes to think in order to lead us to clarity. So this is not literal. What he's saying is that Certainly, before uh, Shakyamuni Buddha attained his enlightenment, there were people who achieved great clarity of vision in their minds, in their lives, through other means. Um, or they were just, uh, it, it was easier for them. But this is a very small percentage of the people. What Shakyamuni brought uh, to uh, humanity was the idea that anyone no matter what their capacity, their capability, their, their, their state, status in life, uh, had access to this Buddha nature. In fact, that this Buddha nature is innate. It's in all sentient beings. It's just a matter of recognizing it. Sounds easy enough, right? And for some of us, it's harder than for others because we just have that many layers of illusions or delusions or whatever you want to call them to bust through in order to see and perceive clearly. So this is the, the, the thrust of all Buddhist scholarship is to lead anyone to understand that you already have this nature. You just don't exist in it. Uh, and that's a matter of training. All right. So, these great bodhisattvas, okay, it was only when the Buddha set forth the four teachings in the Agama, correct and equal, and wisdom periods, that he finally acquired disciples. And although they were uh, <clears throat> doctrines preached by the Buddha himself, they were not doctrines that revealed his true intention. Why do I say this? Now we're talking about earlier Buddhist teachings, and this is where a lot of sectarian problems still exist today. Because the specific and perfect teachings as set forth in the sutras of the correct and equal and the wisdom periods do not differ in meaning from the specific and perfect teachings as set forth in the Flower Garland Sutra. The specific and perfect teachings given in the Flower Garland Sutra are not the specific and perfect teachings of the Shakyamuni Buddha. They are the specific and perfect teachings of Dharma wisdom and the other great bodhisattvas mentioned earlier. These great bodhisattvas may appear to most people to have been disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha, but in fact it would be better to call them his teachers. The World Honored One listened to these bodhisattvas preaching and after gaining wisdom and understanding, proceeded to set forth the specific and perfect teachings of the sutras of the correct and equal and the wisdom periods. But these differ in no way from the specific and perfect teachings of the Flower Garland Sutra. So what does that all mean? The Flower Garland Sutra, some, some of you know it as the uh, Avatatsaka Sutra, others uh, will know it through Japan as the Kigan Sutra, uh, suffice it to say, these were the first sermons that uh, Shakyamuni Buddha delivered uh, immediately following his own personal enlightenment. So a lot of that sermon was about how he came to experience his own enlightenment. And the, th the, 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 uh, uh, the hmm. I don't want to use the same terms because they're confusing, but when he's talking about these great bodhisattvas and brahmins and so forth that, that expounded these teachings, he's not, teach, he's not talking about his own teaching, Shakyamuni Buddha. He's talking about the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, the aha moments. The, I know there's a better word, but I can't think of it right now. That he came to as on his way to his Buddhahood, his enlight his own perfect enlightenment. So the sermon can be misread as being Shakyamuni Buddha's own teaching of enlightenment or how to become enlightened, 
when in fact much of it is his process of coming to enlightenment. And that's not the same thing, is it? So this is what Nietzsche is pointing out here. And, and this is why he speaks of the different periods of Shakyamuni's teachings. Because he, there was a different intent and a different purpose to each teaching. And those intents and purposes, although you could argue with the Kigan Sutra, which he only taught for um, a few weeks, uh, I don't think it was even a month, before he realized that everyone was looking at him like the dog in the wind, you know, like, what? What are you talking about? Uh, because it was such a personal experience that he was espousing that um, he wasn't grasping the minds of the people that he was talking to. So he backed off of that and started all over again from a standpoint of, oh, I need to lead uh, my students or these people who are interested in enlightenment through my own process um, for them to grasp and get there, skillful means. Just telling somebody how exciting it is to be in love does not teach them what it is to be in love. It just tells them your experience. And that can be fascinating, but it doesn't help them, right? So in the same way as you would try to get someone to understand what your rapturous sensation of love is, you would have to seek common ground with them, looking for uh, things that were more commonly understood and start to build this understanding so that they could somehow grasp what it is that you're feeling for themselves, right? And this is the whole scholarship of Buddhism. Okay, I know what enlightenment is like. Do you get it? Uh, uh, okay, so think like this. Look at your breath. Look at the, the, the... And so in stages throughout 50 years of his life, he was slowly bringing the capacities of perception up in the anyone who would listen so that they would eventually be able to achieve what he had achieved in his own lifetime, right? As a human being. Buddhahood is something we experience here in this life. I keep coming back to that, but I keep getting the same questions, so I apologize if I sound repetitive. I need my coffee this morning, sorry. Okay. The specific and perfect teachings in the form of... Okay. Therefore... We know that these great bodhisattvas were the teachers of Shakyamuni. These bodhisattvas are mentioned in the Flower Garland Sutra, where they are called good friends. Take note of this. To call a person a good friend means that that person is neither one's teacher nor one's disciple. The two types of teachings, called Tripitaka, and connecting teachings are offshoots of the specific and perfect teachings. Anyone who understands the specific and perfect teachings will invariably understand the Tripitaka and connecting teachings as well. A teacher is someone who teaches his disciples things that they did not previously know. For example, in the ages before the Buddha, the heavenly and human beings and followers of the Brahmanism, of Brahmanism were all disciples of the two deities and the three ascetics, though they, their doctrines branched off to form 95 different schools. These did not go beyond the views of the three ascetics. Shakyamuni, the Lord of Teachings, also studied these doctrines and for a time became a disciple of the Brahmanic teachers. But after spending 12 years in various painful and, uh, <clears throat> and comfortable practices, he came to understand the principles of suffering, emptiness, impermanence, and non-self. Therefore, he ceased to call himself a disciple of the Brahmanic teachings and instead proclaimed himself the possessor of a wisdom acquired from no teacher at all. Thus, in time, the human and heavenly beings came to look up to him as a great teacher. 
So Nietzsche basically explained what I fumbled through earlier. Um, it is clear, therefore, that during the teaching period of the first four flavors of Shakyamuni, the Lord of the Teachings, was a disciple of Dharma wisdom and the other great bodhisattvas. Similarly, he was the ninth disciple of Bodhisattva Manjushri. This is also the reason why the Buddha repeatedly declares in the earlier sutras, I never preached a single word. When Shakyamuni Buddha was 72, he preached the Immeasurable Meaning Sutra on Eagle Peak in the kingdom of Magadha. At that time, he denied all the sutras he had preached during the previous more than 40 years, and all the fragmentary teachings derived from those sutras, saying, In these 40, then, uh, more than 40 years, I have not yet revealed the truth. End quote. Okay? At that time, the great bodhisattvas and the various heavenly and human beings hastened to implore the Buddha to reveal the true doctrine. In fact, in the Immeasurable Meaning Sutra, he made a single pronouncement that appeared to suggest the true doctrine, but he did not elaborate on it. It was like the moment when the moon is about to rise, the moon is still hidden behind the eastern hills, and though its glow begins to light the western hills, people cannot see the body of the moon itself. The expedient means chapter of the Lotus Sutra in the section that concisely reveals the replacement of the three vehicles with the one vehicle, the Buddha briefly explained the concept of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, the doctrine that he had kept in mind for his final revelation. But because this was the first time he had touched on the subject, it was only dimly apprehended, like the first note of the cuckoo heard by someone drowsy with sleep, or like the moon appearing over the rim of a hill but veiled in thin clouds. Shariputra and the others, startled, called the heavenly beings dragon deities and great bodhisattvas together, and be begging for instruction, said, quote, the heavenly beings, dragon spirits, and others, their numbers like Ganges sands, the bodhisattvas seeking to be Buddhas in the great force of 80,000, the bodhisattvas of the earth, as well as the wheel-turning kings who come from ten thousands of millions of lands, all press their palms and with reverent minds, reverent minds wish to hear the teaching of perfect endowment. So this is the ovations of the Lotus Sutra, right? The passage indicates that they requested to hear a doctrine such as they had not heard in the previous more than 40 years, one that differed from the four flavors and the three teachings with regard to the part they wished to hear the teachings of permanent endowment. It may be noted that the Nirvana Sutra states, quote, Sad, of Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, the title of the Lotus, indicates perfect endowment, the profound meaning of the four uh, Mahayana treatises said, states, quote, Sad connotes six. In India, the number six implies perfect endowment, end quote. In his commentary, Chitsang writes, Sad, quote unquote, is translated as perfect en enlightenment, uh, endowment. In the eight volumes of his Profound Meanings of the Lotus Sutra, Tindai remarks, quote, Sad, S-A-D, is the Sanskrit word which is translated as myo or wonderful, end quote. Bodhisattva Naragarjuna, in the heart of his 10,000 volume, uh, his thousand volume treatise on the great perfection of wisdom, uh, a treatise I urge you all to read, comments, quote, sad signifies six. Nagarjuna was 13th in the lineage of the Buddha's successors, the founder of the True Word, Flower Garland, and other schools, a great sage of the first stage of development, and the person whose true identity was the thus come one Dharma Cloud's Freedom King. The characters Myoho Renge Kyo are Chinese. In India, the Lotus Sutra is called Sadharma Pundarika Sutra. The following is the mantra concerning the heart of the Lotus Sutra composed by the Tripitaka master Shan Wu Wei. Nama Samanta Buddhanna Om A A Am A, -a Sarva Buddha Jan <coughs> It's hard to translate. Sankshibsha Gagana Shambha 
Shambhavalak Shani Sadharma Pundarika Sutra Jaumba <coughs> Ho Vajra Kashyaman Hum Shvala Hail to the Buddhas, three bodied thus come ones. Open the door to show me, cause me to awaken to, and to enter into the wisdom and insight of all the Buddhas. You who are like space and who have freed yourself from form, O Sutra of the White Lotus of the Correct Law, cause me to enter into, to be everywhere within, to dwell in, and to enjoy, rejoice in you. O adamantine protector, O empty aspect free and desire free sutra. I'm going to pause on this because this is this is essential. So Nietzsche quotes this um, because it's a it's a this is a very important part of opening of the eyes. What he's doing here as he has been so far through these previous seven or eight videos as we've been marching through the opening of the Eye Sutra. He's given us an entire history of the development of Buddhism. He's given a history of his own practice and, and, and efforts to attain this uh, Buddhahood and to be a good Bodhisattva, a correct Bodhisattva, right? Because this is how we attain full enlightenment, to be good friends. Um, but this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, exhortation by, um, uh, Tripitaka Master Shan Wu Wei, uh, indicates a, an understanding of what the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra or the Myoho Renge Kyo, uh, the Lotus Sutra, uh, actually represents this, this culminating teachings from Shakyamuni Buddha. And what he's saying is he's identifying what Buddha is. Okay, uh, when he's talking about the insight, you are like space and you have freed yourself of form. So uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people think that awakening is, um, uh, and, and, and I use this rhetoric as well because it's a, a way to access uh, thinking about Buddha. Uh, but our Buddha mind is uh, is really free of the idea of mind at all. Um, what this points to, because the idea of mind is another persistence, isn't it? To think, because right away what we do as humans is you know, mind, well that's brain, right? Because we just want to anchor things in stuff. But the point of the Buddha mind is that we are free from the con the concreteness, the, the concept that everything has a persistence that it exists through time. So what we end up dealing with with perfect enlightenment or endowment is the idea that everything is energy and that energy is like space. Right? What were we talking about in the last couple of decades in science is dark energy. In other words, energy that doesn't interact with light. In other words, energy that isn't fixed. Because when things are fixed, that is persistence and that is an illusion. Nothing is fixed. Everything is constantly in flux and changing. This is mind-blowing. This is difficult for we modern people to even conceive of. So how would they have had to talk about it 3,000 years ago? 700 years ago, a thousand years, whatever, yesterday. Especially, we live in an age that's just consumed with the moment. But not the moment of existence, the moment of possession. Right? Immediate gratification. Everything is, uh, I'm famous, I'm not famous, I have this, I have the new iPhone, I have the this, blah, blah. it's all about possession and persistence and making permanent. We're so in, in, engrossed in it every moment of the day. This is the delusion we need to set aside if we want to see our true nature and the true nature of all of life. We have to stop being anchored to stuffness. So when he talks about you are like space, 
And just think about that for a minute. He's not talking about the universe. He's not talking about all the planets and galaxies. I mean, amazing stuff to consider, sure. But the space, what's in the space, right? Science is asking this question. What's the space? Because they know now in science that 96% of what we are in is this space that is doing something. It's not just... All right. <laughs> Sorry for that interruption. Um, very strange things happening with the camera here. Um, but I, I was in the midst of talking about quiescent energy, a term you've heard me mention many times. Uh, when Shan Wu Wei talks about this, you are like space and who have freed yourself from form. Uh, o Sutra of the White Lotus of the Correct Law caused me to enter into... Uh, to be everywhere within, to dwell in, and to rejoice in you. Uh, o empty, aspect-free, and desire-free sutra. So, this is, in a nutshell, the description of enlightenment. So, if that's all you need to know to be enlightened, congratulations. <laughs> but... I like what it's pointing to here, and I want to make sure you don't miss it. Um, this this uh, Buddha hood, this freed the what early text liberation from uh, cravings. Um, all of this rhetoric, these words that we use, quiescent energy. Another word that I've used and that you've probably run into is potential. Uh, when we talk about the Chinese theory of Wu Ji, right? A, a place of maximum potential. Interesting words, language, such a, such a, um, a foible, a, a fallacy. We, we come up with a word for something that isn't something. What do you think when you think potential? Or for that matter, maximum potential, <laughs> right? That there is something, but that there's not something yet that is... Possibly, possible, not possibly, but possible something. So how do you talk about that? Words fail us. Namo myoho renge kyo. We use these as signifiers, as, as calling forth, as invocations of something that definitely exists, but it exists without being something. It's a potential, it's an energy, it's a, this is how you free yourself from the ideas of tables and skulls and cameras and all of this. Because all of that is wonderful to experience, it's great, it's tremendous, but being attached to the idea that those things are constant, that they're moment to moment not changing, that's the fallacy, that's the delusion. But it's hard to slip through that, isn't it? Because we like our stuffness. <clears throat> so, what the, what Nietzsche is pointing out here as he quotes all of this isn't uh, the concept itself, but um, the presentation of the scholarship of Buddhism and where one should focus one's attention. So he's saying this is the magnificent, amazing culmination of what Shakyamuni Buddha was trying to bring everyone to, and it is in the form of the Lotus Sutra. All the other teachings are valid, they're wonderful, but they're stepping stones. They get you to this. Because if you don't go through the stepping stones, if you don't build your understanding of how things, the nature of things, then when you get to this part, you're like, right, that's magic. Or you just don't get it, right? So, the opening of the eyes. The opening of the eyes is perception. I say this all the time. Buddhism is about perception. Increasing our skills of perceptions. Perceiving what perception is. This mantra, I'm continuing now, which expresses the heart of the Lotus Sutra, was found in the Iron Tower in southern India. In this mantra, Sadharma means correct law. Sad means correct. Correct is the same as Myo, wonderful. Myo is the same as correct. Hence, the Lotus Sutra of the correct law and the Lotus Sutra of the wonderful law 
And when the two characters of for Na Mu, not Nam, Na Mu, are prefixed to Myoho Renge Kyo, or the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Law, we have the formulation Na Mu Myoho Renge Kyo. Myo means perfect endowment. Six refers to the six paramitas representing all the 10,000 practices. When people ask <clears throat> to hear the teachings of perfect endowment, they are asking how they may gain the perfect endowment of the six paramitas and 10,000 practices of the bodhisattvas. In the phrase perfect endowment, endowment refers to the mutual possession of the ten worlds, while perfect means that since there is mutual possession of the ten worlds, then any one world contains all the other worlds, indicating that this is perfect. The Lotus Sutra is a single work consisting of eight volumes, 28 chapters, and 69,384 characters. Each and every character is endowed with the character Myo, each being a Buddha, who has the 32 features and 80 characteristics. Each of the ten worlds manifests its own Buddhahood. As Miao Lo writes, Since even Buddhahood is present in all living beings, then all the other worlds are, of course, present too. This is, this is, this is the crux of the opening of the eyes. This is the crux of Nichiren's entire existence and his preaching. This is the crux of not Shakyamuni Buddha's entire teaching life. This is his enlightenment. So you may want to reread over this particular part, but in this are so many things that as I talk about and, and Buddhist scholarship wrestles with all the time in just these few little paragraphs. The idea that it is Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, not Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Why? Because each and every character is endowed with the character Myo, each being a Buddha who has the 32 features and 80 characteristics. Each of the 10 worlds manifests its own Buddhahood. As, okay, so what what priest, what monk, what what practitioner suddenly decides, well, one of those characters we don't need? Who does that? It's Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, plain and simple. It's right here. Nichiren says it very clearly. Buddha said it very clearly. Nowhere in any of the scholarship of Buddhism, other than sectarian weirdness, in actual scholarship of Buddhism, is... Are those characters somehow changed, concatenated? It, it, it makes no sense. It is Sadharma Pundarika Sutra. It is not sad. It is not Pundarika. It's Sadharma Pundarika. Right? What is it? In every character. Why is every character important? Because it is the culminating teachings of Shakyamuni's life. It is what he discovered. In each character, he has spent his entire life defining, bringing to, uh, uh, creating capacity for understanding has all led to this. If, here we go again with language, but if everything is enlightenment, then how can any part of it be discarded? Right? The Buddha replied to the request of his listeners by saying that, quote, the Buddha wishes to open the door of Buddha wisdom to all living beings, end quote. The term all living beings here refers to Shariputra and it also refers to Ichantikas, persons of incorrigible belief. It also refers to the nine worlds. Thus the Buddha fulfilled his words, living beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. When he declares, at the start of I, at the start I took a vow, hoping to make all persons equal to me, without any distinctions between us, and what I long ago hoped for, has now been fulfilled. This is you can't get any more egalitarian than this, right? 
All the great bodhisattvas, heavenly beings, all others, when they had heard the doctrine of the Buddha and comprehended it, said, quote, Since times past often I have heard the world-honored ones preaching, but we have never heard this kind of profound, wonderful, superior law. Well, they did, they just didn't know it. The great teacher Dengyo comments, Since times past, often I have heard the world-honored ones preaching this, refers to the fact that he that they had heard him preach the great doctrines of the Flower Garland Sutra and the other sutras in the time previous to the preaching of the Lotus Sutra. We have never heard this kind of profound, wonderful, and superior law means that they had never heard the teaching of the one vehicle of Buddhahood propounded in the Lotus Sutra. They understood, that is, that none of the previous Mahayana Sutras, let alone Hinayana, which are as numerous as the sands of the Ganges and include those of the flower garland, correct and equal, and wisdom periods, such as the profound secrets and the Mahavarachana sutras, had ever made clear the great principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, the core of the Buddha's lifetime teachings, nor had they clarified the bone and marrow of those teachings, the doctrines that persons of the two vehicles can attain Buddhahood and that the Buddha attained enlightenment in the remote past. In other words, this space, this energy, this Buddhahood, this isn't an invention of the human mind. It exists contemporarily with our existence. It is our great fortune to be alive and conscious in order to discover this truth. This is why we attain Buddhahood as humans. This isn't some other far off place. We have this energy running through us. It is us. It is our very thoughts. We just need to train our perceptions to understand this in each moment. That is how we free ourselves from the, the hook, line, and sinker of each moment wanting to keep us anchored in that moment because that's impossible. This is the, the human delusion that if we do something, it stays with us forever. It does not. Everything changes constantly. All right. Big surprise. That is the end of part one of Opening of the Eyes. Part two brings with it, well, a tremendous amount. So we will navigate part two starting in the next video. Um, if I've covered anything through quickly here, or if you have questions about anything I've said, please, please make comments. Please let me know. Um, I'm just a man. And I'm determined to make these teachings clear. And the more I delve into them to share with you, the more they impact me as well. So it's our journey together. This is our enlightenment, your enlightenment. Take it by the horns. Face it. Work on it yourself. Nobody's going to give enlightenment to you. Not me, not Buddha, not anyone. It is up to you to locate it, to marry it, to be in it. Anything I can do to help you achieve that is my great honor. Thank you for participating. I love all of you very much. Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. I'll see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Mm -hmm.